This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For news about In Our Time and for recommendations about our archive, please follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoy the programmes. Hello, The Fighting Tamara from 1839 is one of Turner's greatest works, the one he called his darling. It shows a famous ship of the age, a hero of the Battle of Trafalgar, on its final journey, being towed up the Thames to the Breaker's Yard. Most of the canvas is sky, an extraordinary, largely orange sunset, reflected in still water. Near the bottom left of centre is a small, black, fiery tugboat from the new age of steam. Paddles churning, the Tamara, full-masted from the age of sail, ethereal and white glides behind to its fate. When Turner first displayed this masterpiece, the Victorian public was deep in celebrations of the Tamara in era, with work on Nelson's column underway in the new Trafalgar Square, and Thackeray described the painting as a national ode. With me to discuss the fighting Tamara are Susan Foister, curator of early Netherlandish, German and British painting at the National Gallery, David Blaney Brown, the Manton curator of British art at Tate Britain, and James Davy, curator of naval history at the National Maritime Museum. Susan, Museum. Susan Foister, where was Turner in his career in 1839? Well, he was at the height of his powers as a painter, extremely successful. In his early 60s, he had achieved success as a painter when he was very young. He was appointed a full member of the Royal Academy um, when he was only 26 in 1802. And he achieved the success that allowed him to... Um, be commercially successful, to create his own gallery where he would show his paintings, as well as continuing to exhibit at the Royal Academy. In 1839, when the Temeraire was exhibited, he showed three other paintings alongside it. So he was immensely productive, immensely busy, a very well-travelled man, and he had, by that stage, complete command of the powers of painting, and he had transformed the genres of paintings. So landscape painting, seascapes really became something else through Turner, something much more poetic and historic and meaningful. And he was able to use to use light and colour and the ways in which he painted to really transform people's experience of looking at those kinds of scenes. He had an immense sense of history and of his own place in history, I think. He was always a little bit of an outsider. So he, in 1829, had made his will already in which he envisaged leaving his paintings to the nation and that was how the fighting Temeraire came to the nation. So he had this immense sense of the sweep of history and his place in it, not in in an egotistical way um, because he was, I think, a bit of a pessimist in in that sense. He wrote a long poem called The Fallacies of Hope which he constantly quoted um, little pieces to set alongside the subject of his paintings. He was an unusual and original man. There was a double track to simplify it in a way, wasn't it? There was a track that came from being the son of a barber in Covent Garden, whose fa- the father of that barber had been a barber. Uh, he'd, been, he'd been his mother was condemned to what they then called a lunatic asylum mm. and Bethlehem, Bedlam. Uh, and he was sent out to be farmed out to relatives to, to bring him up. But this, 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 let's call it genius, we might as well, uh, showed very early on. His father displayed his paintings in the barber shop and he got into... So there's the track of that track. He never lost his Cockney accent. He never lost that, lost that sort of connection, let us say, with Covent Garden and that. Mm. But he, he had a very classical training. He went into the... When he was 14 and he did the... He copied bus, he copied the great works and so on. Yes, and he um, was very early on successful um, in the work of topographical landscape. So he was particularly successful as a watercolour artist early on. So he would paint subjects like Eton or Oxford or great abbeys. Um, and these were immensely successful subjects that could also be engraved, which was a, another way of making commercial success in this period. So books came out and you got the royalties from that. He was very... Can you tell us about his relationship with the Thames? Because this plays a big part in the Temeraire and in many of his paintings, but Mm. the Thames. 
Well, he was a Londoner, so born in Covent Garden, he was never far from the Thames. And then early on in life, he moved to the western side, a bit, bit beyond London, to Isleworth, and then to Twickenham, where he built a house and lived for a long time. And at that period, he painted a lot of rather beautiful and tranquil um, paintings of the Thames. Um, he had a boat and um, would sometimes go out on the boat, though one shouldn't assume that he was always um, sitting there sketching. And then the Thames continued to play a really important part in um, in his career and in his paintings. And he was very responsive to the dramas of, of the Thames. So, for example, when the Houses of Parliament caught fire, that was an opportunity for a painting of the Thames with this fire blazing around it and reflected in it. Rain, steam and speed, which he painted after the Temeraire, that showed the railway bridge over the River Thames at Maidenhead. Thank you. James Davy. where had the Temeraire made her reputation? The Temeraire was one of the most famous naval ships in Britain by the time Turner was painting the, the fighting Temeraire. Um, it had been launched in 1798 and really was a wonderful example of British shipbuilding expertise. Um, it was a very large ship, 180 foot long, um, and was armed with 98 guns, so a really fearsome armament. And it took, we were told it took 5,000 oak trees to build. Yes, I've read five thousand. I've also read two thousand. It sort of depends where you want to, where you want to. Um, well, how big the oak was? No, well, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Unfortunately, no one at the time actually counted the number of oak trees, um, but certainly a huge, a huge amount. Um, so it was a large ship. It was a fearsome ship, and it took a very active role in the French Revolutionary Wars and then the Napoleonic Wars that followed um, on a range of duties around Europe. Um, it was a key part of the Channel Fleet that blockaded uh, the French Navy in port. It was involved in operations around the Iberian Peninsula, particularly the defence of Cadiz in 1810, um, and various other operations in the Mediterranean and the Baltic Sea, where it was employed protecting British interests there. Um, but of course, the Temeraire is most famously associated with the Battle of Trafalgar, um, this amazing great event in 1805, when a British fleet commanded by Horatio Nelson defeated a much larger fleet um, of French and Spanish ships. Um, Can we go into a bit of detail? Because like, I think mm. all that's really thrilling. So Nelson's on victory. The victory. He does this right angle attack on the French and Spanish fleets, which has yeah. been done before. But it's a very brave thing to do. And he leads. That was a time when they used to lead mm -hmm. the people who run the show, didn't they? And he led and exposed himself uh, to a lot of fire. And he, the victory on which he was, got into terrible trouble. And that's when the Temeraire made his reputation. Ab absolutely. Um, Nelson was trying to lead by example. Um, normally, if you were the commander in chief, you would put yourself in the middle of, of the fleet so as not to expose yourself. And so you could you know, direct the battle as it played out. But Nelson understood that he was asking his ships um, and the crews of his ships to undergo a fearsome bombardment as they approached the enemy. So he made sure that his ship, the Victory, um, was going to be right at the front of um, one of the lines approaching the enemy. Uh, the Temeraire was right behind him. Um, and as you say, yes, the Victory got into um, a bit of bother. Um, it it's was... typical a bit of bother. They're being knocked to bits. <laughs> so it was. It was I mean, I'm 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 being too lighthearted. Absolutely. Um, it was locked in a ferocious combat with the French ship, the Redoutable, um, and it looked for a few moments as if the Redoutable was going to be able to board and take the victory. But just in the nick of time, the Temeraire comes alongside the French ship, um, launches a number of broadsides into it, um, and then boards and takes it. Um, it then repeats the trick um, later in the battle. Uh, another French vessel, the Fougeot, attacks the Temeraire, um, but again, the Temeraire um, fires a number of broadsides into it, comes alongside, uh, boards and, and captures the vessel. So you have this situation at the end of the Battle of Trafalgar. Britain has won a, a great victory, uh, but the Temeraire has played a, a crucial part, capturing two enemy ships, but also coming to the rescue of, of the fleet's flagship. Um, and it's for that reason that when Cuthbert Collingwood um, who was writing his dispatches back to was the Admiralty second afterwards, in command. who was second in command and assumed command following the death of, of Nelson. He's writing his uh, dispatches back to the Admiralty and he only chooses one ship to single out for a special mention and that ship is, is the Temeraire. And from that moment, uh, the Temeraire has this reputation for, for audacious audaciousness in battle and for fighting ability that would um, go on into the 19th century. And then the Temera leads a long uh, life um, doing this, that and the other because its, it's, day, its great days had been done. 
Um, absolutely. So it's a prison it, ship, a prison hulk at one stage. It's um, a guard it, ship. It's it stripped performs of its masts. exactly a, a number of a number of roles. Um, by 1812, um, it is very worn out. Um, it's seen a lot of active service, um, as, I, as I've explained at Trafalgar and elsewhere. And wooden ships decay. That's a, a, a fact of of uh, the 18th century navy. And so by 1812, the Admiralty decides to retire the ship. Um, but of course, it's um, invested a lot of money in the ship over the years so they're not just going to let it go to waste so they use it in a variety of ways um, initially as you say as a prison hulk um, the British had a, a big problem in the Napoleonic Wars trying to house um, the huge numbers of prisoners they captured um, and so one short term measure was to use um, these decrepit old ships um, as essentially floating jails and so the Temeraire was, was uh, a prison hulk for a few years subsequently a receiving ship um, where it would have um, received uh, new recruits, a store ship, and then lastly as a, a guard ship um, at the entrance of the Medway River. Sort of like <coughs> sort of like Black Beauty going down and down the hill, isn't it? Really? That sort of romance to it. <laughs> and David Blaney Brown, what what might the last journey of the Tamara? What made it particularly attractive? Do you think to Turner? Well, I think it, it, it's um, it's important to remember that. He Turner probably never actually saw the last voyage uh, up the Thames to Rotherhive to the Breakers Yard because it wasn't announced in the newspapers, as far as we can tell. It wasn't publicised. Maybe uh, the sort of um, death throes of these great ships was a rather sort of embarrassing and shaming thing, or maybe it was simply happening so often because by that time so many of them were coming to the end of their working lives, that it wasn't a matter of note. But by the time uh, the Temeraire arrived Rotherhithe and was moored and got ready for breaking up, she did become um, a tremendous tourist attraction and was written about in the papers. And that's probably, uh, I think, when Turner thought uh, that this would be um, an interesting subject for a painting. And this would have been in the autumn of uh, 1838, he would have wanted to get a picture ready uh, to respond to this recent topic uh, for the Royal Academy, uh, which opened in May uh, 39. So he would have had to work quite quickly. And I think he uh, thought that um, having um, already painted a picture of the Battle of Trafalgar, including the Temeraire, having painted uh, marine pictures, sea pictures, naval pictures, and indeed watercolours for many years, um, that this was a subject that he should take up. And uh, he began, I, I think, to uh, realise that he could make that subject a kind of elegy for the Nelson era and for the Age of Sail and for the sort of heroic age of fighting ships. Um, and um, he could also introduce uh, the idea of, of uh, on the one hand, the ending of an era and then perhaps uh, the movement into a new one because, after all, uh, the Temeraire was towed upriver by steam tugs. So you have the age of sail on the one hand and the new age of steam on the other. So you have this kind of transition um, from the old to the new, and you could celebrate um, a great past, a great history, um, and and create a kind of image um, of mortality in a way, because the ship in the picture has an almost human quality. It's as if that one ship represents the Navy and all the sailors and the crew and the Marines uh, who had fought in such ships. They could all be... Uh, memorialised in that one picture. And Turner, by this time, by the 1830s, had taken upon himself the mantle of a kind of national painter who uh, aspired to paint national themes that could speak to the country as a whole. And uh, I think that's what he wanted to do uh, in The Fighting Temeraire. I mean, he called the picture The Fighting Temeraire, which evokes her her heroic battle past, um, her role at Trafalgar and afterwards, and he made her representative of uh, that great age of, of fighting ships, the wooden walls, the hearts of oak, that uh, in many ways represented Britain. And so uh, 
he felt he was a kind of a national painter, and I think he was trying to paint a national picture. Well, I was going to ask you lots of follow-up questions, but there's no need. You answered a lot in that one answer. It was terrific, because <laughs> it was this compound, wasn't it, that, 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 that t- I think took it to the hearts of the people. Mm. It was almost a schoolboy's patriotism uh, there, standing with the Thames, watching these great ships uh, right through the, the battle of Trafalgar, the winning mm. of Trafalgar against the, mm. the great enemy and so on. And then the beautiful ship and the towing and the steam and, uh, the steam and sail against each other... Uh, that was great. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on. Susan, um, can you describe this painting that we've been talking about in case some people, I mean, some people won't know it by heart? I've got a pull out here, which isn't very good, but it's, you don't need to see that. Right. Can you describe it, please? Well, it's a marine painting, so it shows you two ships on the water, but actually three quarters of the painting is made up of sky and this fabulous sunset. So the boats are actually concentrated on the left hand side of the composition. And Turner creates this fantastic contrast between two ships, between this great hulk, the bulky fighting Temeraire, which is represented really as as a ghost because he paints it um, in a very pale colour. You you see some masts. You see also um, a part of it in the front is actually broken down, but it, it's very it's very pale, and then in contrast with that and overlapping it is this black tugboat, and the tugboat is pulling it towards you, the viewer, and of course because it's a tug, it's a steamship, and out of the funnel is coming this burst of fiery smoke. I think you don't quite know whether this is partly flame coming from its boiler or whether the smoke is partly being coloured by this terrific sun sunset on the other side of the painting. And that's what I think really draws you in. Um, Turner is wonderful at creating these sense of immense skies that sort of disappear over your head and draw your eye to the horizon. So you're on a river, but you only get a very faint sense of the shoreline on either side, just a few buildings. But the sunset is painted in such an immensely powerful and colourful way as to draw your eye down to the horizon and down to the distance. So I think that also adds to this sense of of the drama and the sun going down and the old ship coming up the river. And then also, in contrast to the sun on the right-hand side, if you look up into the top left of the painting, you can see the crescent moon, the white moon, and the moon is also casting a reflection on the water. So you get these terrific reflections, the sunset reflected in the water and this golden light. You get the reflections from the boats, although the the steamer is churning up the water a little bit. There are these beautiful reflections. It looks very still and calm. And then the moon is also casting this rather beautiful silvery reflection on the water. James, can you describe the scene and the last journey as it really would have looked? Because this is a poetic interpretation as uh, David has said, there's no evidence that he saw this. Uh, he did never claim to see it. People like to think he'd seen it because they like to think that these things are realistic. In fact, this was mostly imagined, although the ship was a ship and the tugboat was the tugboat and the Thames was the Thames and the sunset's the sunset. Um, but what actually happened? This is full mustard. It's a beautiful ship. That's a start. Now then, start there. Well, I, I don't think I'm going to be controversial when I say that, you know, Turner's painting... Um, of this event wasn't, you know, wholly accurate. Um, I think what you mean by accurate. Well, indeed. But I I think one of the important things to to think about when you're trying to imagine what this scene would have been like in 1838 is is firstly to give some sense of just how busy the River Thames would have been with tens if not hundreds of ships passing up and down every day, ships of all sizes from Great East Indiamen off off to the Far East down to um, small colliermen bringing coal from the North East into the capital or even watermen going about their daily business um, back and forth across the river. Um, taking passengers uh, back and forth. Um, so all of that would have been going on and you don't really get much of a sense of that in, in Turner's painting, just the, the sheer density of traffic that would have been on the river. Um, 
And obviously there are other things about this painting um, that the Temeraire is shown fully mastered um, and with some sails, albeit furled, um, which would have been taken off before it was it was towed up river. Um, but I think to focus on these points, you're, you're sort of missing the point of the painting. Um, you know, Turner wasn't trying to recreate one specific event. Um, he was trying to do something far more reflective. He had gone to see the, the he had gone to see the remains of it. We understand not going up the Thames. But when it was taken to the Knacker's Yard, he went yeah. and so he'd have seen the big ship without the masts and so on. Uh, exactly. I mean, as as many hundreds, if not thousands, of people did when the ship was being broken up at Beetson's Yard in in Rotherhive. Um, it did become, as David's already said, a bit of a visitor attraction. Um, lots of people came, um, visited, tried to take little mementos. Um, one one really nice example at the National Maritime Museum, we've got a, a beautiful barometer that's made from the wood of, of the Temeraire. Um, but also there was a very uh, there was a very strong line in um, souvenir prints of the ship being broken up that were very popular and sold in, in great numbers. David David Bernie Brown, how does the sky set? <coughs> how does the sky set the emotional tone of the program? Constable said, but the, the sky was always the uh, it powered emotion. Uh, it certainly does in this one. Can you describe how it does, and well, why? And why you think it does? Well, at least half the picture is given over to the sunset, and uh, actually the entire right half of the painting really is empty, apart from sky and water. I mean, the Thames flows on um, up towards London. Um, uh, it, it's, it's empty of ships, as James has said. It's empty of vessels, which, of course, uh, it, it would not have been. It would have been densely crowded. I mean, it took it took the Temeraire two days working with the tides and moving very, very slowly uh, to negotiate its way, um, towed by two tugs, not one. Uh, Turner shows only one. Uh, it took it two days to get from Sheerness to Rotherhithe, I believe, and um, one doesn't get any sense of that in the painting. It seems to be very smooth and very serene and very calm and very easy. Half the painting is given over to the sky and to this really spectacular sunset. And, um, of course, the, the setting sun um, conveys the idea of, 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 of time, of an ending, of the passing of a day, and through the passing of the day, perhaps the passing of an era, and also, of course, the red tint of the sunset perhaps also suggests blood. Um, I mean, I don't want to go over all Ruskinian about this, but, of course, you know, Ruskin was sort of constantly um, t talking about, you know, Turner's bloodshot skies. And, I mean, Turner certainly later on painted an extremely bloodshot sky over a painting of Napoleon um, in exile on St Helena. But I think in this painting, perhaps, the, 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 the ruddy glow is there as a beautiful thing, but also perhaps it does evoke the, the appalling bloodshed that would have taken place on board the Temeraire when she was actually in battle. I mean, her decks, you know, it would have her, 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 her decks would have been awash with blood, which would have had to be washed off, hosed down um, uh, uh, and removed. I mean, uh, uh, she would have been an absolute bloodbath. But I think that um, Turner loved his sunsets. He painted them all the time. He studied them in watercolour. Even as a boy, he used to walk up to Hampstead Heath and lie on his back and make studies of the sky. Um, uh, we have uh, sketchbooks at the Tate that are entirely devoted to small watercolour studies um, following the progress of sunsets or uh, sky effects. So he would have had a reserve of imagery in the studio to draw on to create a sky like this. But it's there primarily, I think, as, as, as an emotional force, uh, yeah. just as Constable described. The sky could set the emotional tone of a painting. But the sunset on the one hand, and as Susan has said, equally important, is the moon, because that does convey as the sun sets, so the moon rises. And in the same Royal Academy exhibition in 1839, uh, Turner showed two paintings of ancient and modern Rome, um, in moonlight and uh, uh, um, uh, sunlight, and he quoted Byron um, with one of those paintings. Uh, um, the moon is up, and yet it is not night. The sun still divides the day with her, 
which we which is what we see realized in this painting too. Thank you, thank you very much. I didn't see some much blood. It's, I, the sunset, you all know, ten times more, hundred and ten times more than I do. But I think what the sunset says is this is a glorious ending. It's more about glory, it seems to me, than about... What do you think, Susan? I think you do get a sense of, of glory there as well as a sense of the passing of, of time. So it, it's the last glorious blaze of that sun going down that I think you also um, respond to in looking at that And at the age of sail, and, and certainly the, the work is done, the, the, the dictator has been overthrown, uh, safety returns, and that sort of thing. England th- goes back to being England. Yes, and I think there's no doubt that Turner had been deeply affected by that period of the Napoleonic Wars, had had everybody in England. And for him, the ending of the war represented um, a lifting of the restrictions on travel. He was able, for the first time, to go to Italy to see paintings there. And that was also transformational for his practice of painting. And to see the sky there. But stick here for this one. What about his... Can you tell us something about his brushwork on this? Well, this is a painting that's um, in really quite good condition. So when you look at the painting, you can still see the marks of Turner laying his brush on in three dimensions. If you look at it particularly in raking light, when the light is falling on it at an angle, you can see exactly the texture of the paint and the marks of the brush, for example, in that patch of of brilliant red, vermilion red above the the sun. That's really thickly painted. The moon, um, although it's small and rather delicately formed, is very thickly painted, and the reflections of moonlight on the water. Again, he's using paint thickly, rather quickly, with a broad brush to give that um, effect. He knew exactly what he was doing. But at the same time, there are passages in the painting that are deliberately thinly painted. Um, The temeraire itself is rather thinly painted and not painted in immense detail. He's just using little strokes of darker brown against the the pale um, off-white to suggest the form of the the ship there. Um, And the passages of reflections in the water, um, again, there's this luminosity and transparency, which I think is something that he's brought into oil painting from his experience of watercolour painting. Uh, James, you talked about the, 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 what had happened to the Temera since its glory days. Um, but one of the reasons that this is a sort of farewell, the last, is, is it's a farewell to sail. It's beginnings of a farewell to sail. What is happening between the time of Trafalgar and the arrival of the tugboats from Newcastle called uh, London and... I can't remember the other name. Um, Samson. Samson. London and Samson, it was called. called. What is happening? Is, is, is it a recognised takeover? Is it resisted, as most takeovers are in this country? Or is it welcomed? What's happening? Well, the 1830s are a really interesting time for the Royal Navy. Um, the Royal Navy is the largest uh, naval force in the world, um, larger than its next few rivals added together. Um, and the Navy really is at the centre of British interests, defending the nation from potential invasion, protecting British trade around the world. Um, and so there's a very great nostalgia in Britain, particularly for the Navy of yesteryear and particularly for the Navy of, of Nelson's time. Um, and you see this in, in um, all kinds of manifestations, um, not least Trafalgar Square, which at this period is being named and subsequently there's a committee to decide what on earth they're actually going to put in this square. And, of course, in the early 1840s, you end up with Nelson's Column, which, of course, still stands today. So there's this remarkable um, nostalgia on the one hand, um, but also a growing sense of unease about this this new technological revolution, which is STEAM, um, which has the potential to completely transform the way that navies operate um, and the way that ships are built. Um, The Royal Navy has been experimenting with steam vessels since the early 1800s, but it's in the 1830s that it really becomes um, in vogue, if you like, with with the first first warships designed and constructed um, with steam propulsion. Um, And the reaction to this is is really divided. On the one hand, there's a lot of excitement about this this new technology and how the Royal Navy um, is in exactly the right place to take advantage of it, but also a degree of insecurity and unease. Um, because of its potential transformational nature, if one of Britain's rivals, perhaps France or, or Russia or whoever, gets ahead of the technological game, suddenly um, the whole Royal Navy could be become obsolete. 
Um, and one of the things I, I think is fantastic about the fighting Temerad painting is you see both of these ideas in the painting. You have the sort of patriotic nostalgia um, represented by the Temeraire on its, on its last voyage, but you also have the juxtaposition with the steam tug. Um, so it's at once saying that um, Britain has been dominant at the seas in the past, it's dominant at sea um, right now, but the future is not clear. And actually, just to, to finish um, with what uh, David was saying about the other things Turner's working on at this time, um, he's, he's fascinated by imperial decline. That's why he's painting these um, paintings of ancient and, and modern Rome. Um, and I think he's, he's doing something very similar in this painting. He's saying that Britain does dominate the seas, but it's, this is not guaranteed to last forever. Can I come back to you on this question of colour again, David? Because it, you look at it, you, know, it, you look at the colour, <laughs> obviously. You do. But is there, is there more to say about his use of colour? Has, have we exhausted that subject? Well, I, I mean, Turner was an extraordinarily original colourist, and his pictures were uh, increasingly vividly coloured as he developed. I mean, if, if one goes to the National Gallery or one goes to the Claw Gallery at the Tate and one looks at the national collection of Turner's paintings in the Turner Bequest, one can see how his early paintings are actually quite dark, quite sombre, but they become more and more brilliant over time. He's and discovering new pigments. He's discovering he? new and pigments. And he's very bold about using Absolutely. the new pigments he, he discovered. He was an early adopter of new pigments. And can indeed, you give us examples of one are, or two of them? There are new pigments in, in this painting, uh, I mean, um, if one looks at the, the reds, the crimson reds, the scarlets, uh, and the yellows in this painting, which play off against each other and, of course, are melded together in the sunset, um, these are new pigments. I mean, he, he, in this picture, he uses two vermilions, one of which was, uh, had been in use for most of his life, but the other, um, an iodine-based pigment, um, a particularly vivid scarlet uh, that is sometimes called Red Lake, uh, Scarlet Lake, uh, that was a new development, recently developed by a friend of Turner's, Humphrey Davy. And uh, the yellow, um, an intense lemon yellow, which of course is softened out in the painting because uh, it's working in, in conjunction with other colours. But at and its black. core, it's a new colour, uh, that, that lemon yellow, um, a, a barium-based chromate yellow. That was new, very new, and something that Turner used really more than any other artist at the time and was criticised for and joked about because, you know, he said once, I, you know, I've taken all the yellow unto myself this year, you know, there's none left for you. Uh, and black was not thought to be a suitable colour of itself in painting. It was meant to be created by mixing other colours. And uh, to show it by itself, as he does in the smoke and in the tug, was really quite new and um, uh, unacceptable to uh, many eyes. But, of course, in this painting, um, it works in juxtaposition with other colours. Um, he was using a new cobalt blue that we can also see in the picture. And uh, his, his colouring uh, was entirely original. Can we switch to the, uh, the men who are absent? But still, he had a great nostalgia for the people who sailed the ships to sea, especially into battle. Is that right, Susan Foister? How did this play in the, in the making of this painting? Well, he had certainly had a history of making paintings of the Battle of Trafalgar, as we've mentioned, showing the sailors. Um, on the second occasion when he was he had a royal commission, he was commissioned by George the Fourth to paint this immense battle painting. It was absolutely full of sailors. I mean, in that way the fighting Temeraire, I suppose, is a sort of ghostly reminiscence of that mm -hmm. of that battle scene, full of people. But in the commission that he painted for, in the first place, St James's Palace, you see sailors swarming over these boats and you see their suffering, and you see their suffering thrust in front of you, not only with the blood, but there's one particular sailor who looks almost as though he's being crucified in front of you. So Turner certainly felt great empathy for the suffering of the sailors in these battles. And you think uh, that this um, James played a part in the uh, powerful and uh, often dismissed the idea of nostalgia that's in this painting? 
that he could rely on, as it were, the British people to mm. fill in the sailors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the other things that's happening in the 1830s, which I, I didn't mention earlier, is uh, a great number of autobiographies that are written by sailors who are active in the Napoleonic Wars, um, sort of essentially publishing their reminiscences. Um, and quite a lot of these are quite sensationalised accounts of um, their life in the Navy. Uh, but there is a very broad um, popular interest, not just in what Nelson and his fellow officers were doing in this period, but also the sailors of this period too. And that's something Turner's definitely drawn on in the past, um, particularly with his Battle of Trafalgar painting. Um, its absence from the fighting Temeraire, or the absence of individuals, of people, is is very interesting. And I, I think you're right to say that he almost doesn't need to. And, and we come back to, again, what David was saying, that the, the Temeraire was almost um, a living thing in and of itself. You didn't, the ship was a living thing, so you didn't actually need um, people to, to populate the painting. David, people like to look at realistic painting and say they got it wrong. I mean, they look at Salisbury Cathedral and they say the rainbow couldn't have been in that place. I'm not going to look at it anymore. <laughs> we had that sort of reaction. Now, but there were quite a few things that you could say in the pedantic and, and photographic sense wrong with this painting. Can you just tell us one or two of them, starting with the sunset? Well, the sunset, um, of course, uh, I mean, the sun would not have been setting when the Temeraire arrived at Rotherhive because this was in September, and I think I'm right in saying she actually arrived at Rotherhive at about three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, exactly. uh, so to um, have the sun so low in the sky um, and the moon already halfway up uh, is, a, is, is, is a total fantasy. But so, the real thing about the sun, come on, tell does, the people the real thing about the problem with the sun. But the sun's also in the wrong place. That's it. It's okay. in the wrong place because, of course, the sun sets in the west. Uh, 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 the, um, the Temeraire and the Tug are quite clearly moving um, at least halfway in the opposite direction and not up river at all. Maybe I'm wrong, James. No, no, not at all. Um, there was um, a lot of studies in the, the late 19th century to try and work out if it was at all possible on one of the bends of the Thames yes. for, the sun to, for, the, for the sun to be behind uh, the Temeraire, and it, it, it just isn't. But I think <laughs> we'd all agree that it's completely bizarre to expect a picture like this to be absolutely literal in those sorts of details. It is, of course, an invention, and the, 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 it's coming back to the point that um, you, you know we were exploring earlier. Uh, the sunset is there for emotional reasons. It's there um, to set the, the mood and the tone of the painting. It's not there because it happened at a particular time in a particular place. The other thing that's really quite spectacularly wrong, and would, Turner would have known this because he, he travelled on steamboats all the time. He went up and down the Thames to Margate. He went across the Channel. He knew exactly where um, a steamboat's funnel would have been positioned in relation to its boiler, i.e. over it, it would not have been um, up towards the bows and um, a long way away from the boiler and the paddles. Um, it would have been centre, uh, but Turner's moved it uh, so that, of course, the funnel doesn't um, conflict with the bow of the Temeraire itself. And He's as I understand it, when this, when this was made into a print, the, the printer moved it back to where it should have been. And, and Turner the printer moved it back. He was curious. livid. He was and livid. livid. Yeah. And, and oh, in right, fact, too. The, right. The, if he wants the funnel edition, to be there, he can put the funnel there. It is. The second edition, uh, uh, you know, at Turner's behest, was, was re-corrected <laughs> to put it back where, where he wanted it in the first place. How was the painting received, Susan? Well, it attracted Start him. Start with Thackeray. Well, Thackeray um, was really inspired by this, this painting. I mean, he, he was somebody who wrote a lot about Turner's <coughs> paintings and often was slightly appalled by Turner's use of, of colour. Um, one of the things that made Turner controversial was that he didn't paint in the ways that people expected. He wasn't representing actuality. He wasn't a naturalistic painter. So Turner would write about um, the colours being pea green when they should have been red and red when they should have been pea green. But with the Temeraire, he really responded to what Turner was trying to do with colour and with the story of the ship. And he was particularly taken by the tug, which he called a spiteful tugboat that was dragging the Temeraire to its, um, right. to its end. Right. And he called it a national ode, didn't he? The, the whole painting. Was he, a... Yes, and like many of the critics, he found it was poetry and painting. And that's how he responded. He also called the tug, I mean, Thackeray also called the tug the Temeraire's executioner. 
But you think he's wonderful because, of course, it humanises the tug as well as the... Uh, uh, you know, if, if the Temeraire is representing uh, Nelson's entire navy, you know, all the people that had served in it in the form of one ship... So, um, you know, so the tub is representing this, 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 this thing, this creature that is actually killing all that off. James, when the Tamara was broken up, mm. uh, it paid a lot of money for it, didn't it, the man? Over £5,000 in those days. I, let's yep. not translate it. People can work it out for themselves. It's sure. an incredible <coughs> amount of money to pay for a Hulk. Mm -hmm. It paid that. It was broken up. What happened to it? What did the, where did it go? Um, well, it remained at Rotherhithe at Beetson's Yard, where the it bits, was broken where up. Did they yeah, go? well, they were used for all sorts of things. Um, so the story goes: a lot of houses built um, on both banks of the Thames were were built using timber from the Temeraire. Um, and just the, the breaking up this ship would have taken years. Um, it really was a long process, and the fact that it took so long is what like allowed... Like an oak mine. Well, <laughs> in a way, yeah. And that's actually what allowed it to become a visitor attraction, because it was there for so long. People could had had many months, if not years, to come come and look at it. But curious souvenirs, there were chairs made out of it, mm -hmm. and picture frames made with, this is from the Temeraire, and yeah. on and on it went. There's all sorts of things around the country that are, are made from the wood of the Temeraire. I'm, af I'm afraid there are more things made from the wood of the Temeraire than could possibly have originally constructed uh, a 98-gun ship of the like. It depends if you buy the 5,000 oaks. If you buy the 5,000 oaks. Um, uh, but certainly a lot of people kept, kept relics of the ship um, and, and, and really treasured them. So, David, what, we're coming to an end now. What, is there a key thing that's, that's made this the most popular painting? The British people is that their most popular painting. Is there a one thing about it, or is it the compound that you so carefully gave us at the beginning of the program. I think, f for me, it's the compound, um, but, of course, I couldn't possibly speak for everybody else. But I think, you know, it, it, it is a great ship that speaks for an era, um, and uh, I, I think people love this... this, this, this um, uh, the way in which the ship plays against the sky, the light, the colour. You can love this painting even if you don't have in your, in your emotional and sort of historical DNA some sense of, you know, the hearts of oak, the, uh, the great age of sail, the navy, British sea power and so on. Susan, very briefly, did this move Turner on as a painter? Did the painting of it make him move forward as a painter? I think it was the sort of culmination of a certain type of experimentation with paint, and he went on after that to paint even more extraordinary pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan Foister, David Blaney Brown, and James Davy. Next week, Byzantine Laws. We'll be discussing Justinian's legal co code, a um, body of law from the 6th century AD. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Oh, did you enjoy it, by the way? We yes. loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Great fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what did we miss out? What, what should we have done that we didn't cover? I, I suppose one thing I'm quite interested in um, is the contrast between the fighting Timur and his earlier painting of the Battle of Trafalgar mm. in, in, from the 1820s, because obviously the public reception to... Uh, the Battle of Trafalgar painting, I mean, it got a lot of criticism, particularly from naval officers, for not being accurate mm. um, and not at all representing one moment of the battle and trying to do something a bit more that, sophisticated that than The big painting, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that, exactly. That, that was yes. the big one. Not so much the uh, the first one, right. the 1806 mm. painting. Mm. Which is for the, the masthead yeah. of the ship. But, yeah, but the ironically, ship. for the one that he, the big one he painted in the 1820s, he actually did a lot of preparation, mm. didn't he? Mm. I mean, he mm. specifically got, I believe, the, the plans of the victory in order to shape his... Um, yes, he did. And he went to see the victory. And indeed he had those... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, he, he um, uh, you know, when he was painting the 1806 picture, mm. he actually went... Um, as soon as she got back, you mm. know, as soon as the victory was brought back, a wreck, of course, after mm. the battle for repairs, mm. uh, he went down to um, to Sheerness mm. and went on board and filled a sketchbook mm. with drawings and uh, disposition. What, uh, disposition, disposition of the ship. In the notes of one of you, you say that that. that some of the men who worked there so had made their own sketches and gave them to him and said, "Look, this I is think where they probably was. did yes. because actually, if one looks at the sketchbook, 
you, you can see that actually those those diagrams are not in his own hand. And uh, when he went on board, mm. of course, um, there was still a skeleton crew, and even some of the Marines mm. had not yet been sent on leave or sent right. to hospital. Mm. You, you know, they were still there was still a skeleton uh, crew on on board, and so he was able to interview them mm. and get their on the spot accounts of the battle. He drew a few portraits. Um, he drew descriptions of what had happened during the battle, and he also made two larger drawings on deck that showed, um, you know, the arrangement of the masts, exactly where Nelson had been uh, shot and, you know, where you know, the officers had come to help him and so on. And all that, of course, um, helped him to to make the painting. Which he, called, is, he called the Temeraire my darling, didn't yes, he? He learned yes. it out once and he said, I'm never going to learn it out again and I'm never going to sell it. Yes. Uh, uh, what, what was this? He had, I mean, meant it, didn't he? Was yes, his darling, he absolutely did. did. He yeah. was apparently offered um, £5,000 for it and he wouldn't take money for it. He wanted to keep it. That's almost um, as much as the Temeraire. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, I was struck yeah. by that when you, yeah. when you mentioned yeah, that. And that, that we know it was kept in his gallery along with the other paintings that he wanted to come to the nation. So after his death in 1851, there was this terrific fight about his will, but eventually his paintings came to the National Gallery. And one thing that perhaps people don't um, appreciate is that when the National Gallery was first built, the Royal Academy, which we've referred to, where Turner showed his paintings, where he showed the Temeraire in 1839, was in the National Gallery, the right-hand side of the building that we know today. So that painting was shown in Trafalgar Square, moved to his gallery, then came back to Trafalgar Square and was put on display in 1857. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, now we have the entry of the producer with a, an <laughs> offer you can't refuse. Tea, coffee or tot of rum. <laughs> <laughs> there are more than 700 programmes to download and listen to for free from the In Our Time website, where you'll also find a reading list for this episode.